Oh, great. Thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting we talk about uh, professional development and what we need for teachers and how we're going to make it, um, make it so that it leads to student achievement, which is the ultimate uh, goal. And uh, one of the things that uh, we're doing at, at, the, at the ISD level at Oakland Schools is uh, we've gone through, and I've been part of some training um, for the adaptive schools model you know, where we're looking for professional development for the teachers, administrators, and really the bottom line is a collaborative approach. As we look at uh, resources uh, that are shrinking, not growing, and um, reduction in staff size, you really need to look at the talent base that you have within classrooms and within schools and work with administrators to do that. So I've been very pleased to be part of that initiative, and it is a, a district-wide initiative uh, with Oakland Schools where we have uh, all stakeholders that are present, and we've gone through uh, some of that training. And uh, sometimes we get uh, caught up in the fact that, uh, as we talk about, we've mentioned today here, the relationship aspect. We talk about relevance. We, we talk about rigor. And then, you know, when you build in school climate, well, all of that stuff feeds into it. And sometimes we get caught up in, you know, steps one, two, and three leading to that improvement and then forget about the other elements of school climate and communication um, that's important. And so I'm, I'm excited about this because I think uh, as we've taken a look at it, it allows for the teacher leadership uh, to grow and uh, also then for uh, those ideas to be shared and um, have a situation where it's not solely focused on one or two administrators at a uh, school building level that are going to drive everything. I mean, we've always had school improvement teams or these types of committees, but this is really a mindset that we go in for the adaptive schools piece where we can all work together and utilize it and, and actually practice the craft um, that we're looking at. And so that's one of the things that we're working on um, at an ISD level and uh, Oakland schools level, which I think has been great because uh, they've brought together some of those uh, teacher leaders along with administrators uh, to work with it. Um, also, as, as um, John indicated, and uh, Kathleen was there as well when we were at the uh, diversity forum, what a great day. If you could have been in there with them, and some of you were, to see these young people and their ideas, and I've said this multiple times, sometimes I don't think we give our young people enough credit for what they can do or what they believe or what their thoughts are at their young age. Obviously, um, they only know what they know at their 16, 17, 18-year-old uh, experiences. But, you know, really I think the key there, and we had some great participation in student-led and and uh, one of my students, Harrison uh, Shelby, invited me to participate in the program. And he also was one of the key planners, student organizers that was on the panel. But the young lady um, that, that really uh, that put this together, um, I think, uh, just did a, uh, a phenomenal job. And uh, uh, Ashna is uh, from Hi uh, Farmington High School. And, you know, really just allowed me to step back and say, you know, one person can make a difference. There were many people there that participated in the event, but through her studies and what she has done and what she saw as a young person, I think um, is, is just a, a great piece. And obviously want to uh, commend the board on helping them move that forward because of your support for that uh, resolution. They then have been able to launch the first one, and I hope continue to do that. Because as we talk about student or teacher leaders, we also need student leaders, and these young people have done that to help make a difference in their schools. And they're very astute on what's going on around them. When you listened, as John had indicated, to some of the things that they were coming up with and what they saw and what they felt and what teachers needed and what students needed to do. So definitely a very, a very good uh, opportunity to, um, you know, start the conversation and, and get the ball rolling. Um, in an unbelievable uh, November, I was very fortunate to sit on the panel there were four of us that were selected to sit on the PBS uh, teacher town hall uh, that dealt with American Graduate. Let's make it happen. And um, I want to thank all of the people that uh, helped uh, put that together. But more importantly, I think uh, what we were discussing there, uh, along with some of the uh, network of Michigan educators that were in the audience, was a conversation starter. Uh, just as I, I think Mike alluded to some of the other meetings there, there's some tensions and things. And once you get past all of those things, you can finally get down to what's important. And I think some of our time was spent, rightfully so, that evening getting past some of those things. But now that the conversation has started, I think really the key element is what do we do next and how do we solve some of these things for these teachers that are reaching out saying, you know, I want to turn around and give feedback to my students. 
but I don't have the tools, technology, or the know-how to do that. How can I speed that process up as, as an example uh, for one of those things? And so it was a great, uh, great opportunity. We had a 90-minute uh, session where we were able to um, talk about some of those tough topics that were out there, and I thought it was well done, and I hope that it continues uh, to have those types of conversations because the focus was, you know, on, on uh, a high-risk population, if you will, the dropouts, and much of the things that we're, we're talking about here today, we want to make sure we keep them engaged. We want to make sure that they're able to, you know, get the information and the education that they need. And a follow-up to that, I've spent uh, the last couple of months, I've had uh, several opportunities to uh, speak at a few different legislative breakfasts and uh, share some of the student data that I shared with all of you here that we shared with our own Oakland Schools Board of Education on student achievement. And um, it caught the eye of uh, one of our, our state reps, and there is an Eye on Oakland um, cable television show. And I had the opportunity, I mean, this is just amazing for career and tech ed. They didn't have to ask many questions because I was able to build in a lot of different things that we're sharing. We basically had a half an hour to explain just what of all the great opportunities are available for young people through career and technical education. And I think one of the big biggest things that I've learned through serving this year as Michigan's Teacher of the Year and all the great conferences and um, events that I get to attend, when we look at that, sometimes I think that uh, we don't always have an, a, a huge buy-in or understanding that uh, there is a segment, CTE, that meets a lot of the demands that we're trying to do and, else, and elsewhere in other programming. And we've discussed that, and I think it's a realization of that. But again, I think sometimes it's the best kept secret, so I'm hoping that, uh, you know, that, that little bit that we did there helps to share that we're meeting the high school requirements, the academic requirements, the stackable certs, and all of those uh, very valuable things that uh, Career and Tech Guide um, is able to provide for students. And I'm going to try to switch over here and see if I can go on to a website. Um, and one of the things that also came out from, let me see how this is going to work. Oop. from um, the various meetings that I've had an opportunity to attend is the fact that um, oops, it's not good. Ah, want me to log in? Oops. Yeah, I thought I, I thought I had it right, but she she left it here for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was really pleased that the, at the conference on, on diversity that was organized by Ashna, who's the one who presented here, to learn that the department had really followed up or been passed that resolution and provided staff support to help them get organized. I was not aware that this that we had done anything in that regard, and it was really a good, very good thing. I wanted to thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we <laughs> John needs to talk into the mic, as I do. No, thank you for that. We 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 do follow up. I mean, I, you, you, you <laughs> so and, and you know, and I th I think that that's you know very important that we do that. And, and I can just I know from a from a young person's standpoint. To be able to be recognized and to be able to pull, I mean, that was a tremendous event of where we're at. And I mentioned last board meeting, and this came out of a, a legislator meeting, and they said, you know what, we don't, we don't see all of the successes that you educators are providing for students. And they said, we need to know more of that. So two purposes for what I've done here was celebrate success. So I gave it some thought, and celebrate success is a section here on my website that uh, we celebrate uh, teachers, we celebrate students. And uh, what I'm asking for is for our fellow educators, administrators, to be able to submit some of their stories so that we can celebrate these success and then we can share them with our legislators. You know, they see a lot of data and they see a lot of things in annual year-end reports, but it doesn't put a name and a face with what's happening out there. And just as, as Kathleen said, it's nice that uh, we see a young person that came to this board, went out there and put on a wonderful program that's going to be replicated. I think these are some of the things that are there. So it's kind of a twofold purpose. And so I have my first
couple here that I want to share with you. Um, these are the stories that are out there, and this one young man uh, that I'm going to share with you is Harrison Shelby, who was part of that diversity forum. Uh, the first uh, person that we celebrated, obviously, was uh, Julian Jenkins Wall, who was the uh, National Milken Award winner um, that we had the wonderful opportunity to be a part of. But I just want to show you a little clip uh, of Harrison and what he's celebrating for what he's done as a junior um, from Oak Park High School, but also was enrolled in my business management, marketing, and technology program. Do we not have sound? Oakland Schools Tech Campus BNT cluster. Um, today I'm here. I'm sorry, if we could just start that over again. That Hi, I'm Harrison Shelby, junior um, student at Oak Park High School, also at Oakland Schools Tech Campus BNT cluster. Um, today I'm here to talk to you about um, the $5,000 scholarship I was awarded from Western International Optimistic Club. They looked at my GPA my community service projects, and also my future plans. I plan to uh, major in political science and also business in college. Um, I, was, I personally like to thank them for awarding me with this fantastic um, $5,000 scholarship. So, yeah, he's, he, he, he really, as a junior, has already earned this, has already gone on and done some things, and he was part of the diversity forum. He's making a huge impact at Oak Park High School with one of the students that, or one of the schools that we, uh, that we work with at the technical campus. And I'm just so excited to have this young man in my program and work with him, and he was the connection to have me participate in the diversity forum. So again, my goal is as I go out, let people know that this is available so that we can celebrate those successes and that young people can see that their work can be rewarded and we can share it uh, with uh, outside of their own four walls of what's happening in their schools or at our technical campus. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks, Paul. Great idea. John, I think you're going to lead the discussion on the, uh, the item related to the budget. Famous item G. Um, and I'm talking into the microphone, as you can see. So uh, let, me, let me talk you through. And the yellow document is the latest, latest, because I kept trying to integrate some input from folks. And we can continue to do more input here. Um, if you want to help from board members talk you through what, what this is intended for, and then what's changed, and draw your attention to some of the specifics. Uh, as you all know, uh, we have the opportunity, responsibility, to uh, provide leadership and supervision over all education, including higher education, and to make recommendations about the financial requirements for education. Uh, we did, I think, a decent job of that uh, in 2010. Uh, in a bipartisan way, we went through a process, got a lot of input, and I was reminded, and reminding myself, we got some very um, significant pro bono analytic help from public sector consultants dedicated to support that process, and Michigan Future, and others, that did a lot of things to help us scope out, um, as we work through, what are the basic requirements, what are the elements of an education system we want to see, what does it cost to provide early childhood education for all? What, how much money would we save if we had meaningful consolidation shared services? I know Carolyn and Nancy and everyone except Richard and Dan and Eileen was not a part of that bipartisan analysis and set of recommendations. But that, that set of recommendations and the analysis that supported it, I think, is, is an example of what uh, one item here we'd like to replicate so that starting next year, we are ready for the following year with some more detailed, specific, uh, new assessment of what does it take to be educated, what does it mean to provide an education in Michigan, and then what would it cost, and where would we find the money to deliver that education. So the first page here is really a um, statement of that um, target. Let's do that process, and I did add in before the bullets, I think it is contingent on us having some credible, serious help uh, that allows us to do the analytics and the number crunching well, uh, not coming from the department. So how we get that support, from where, for what price, with what support, we need to figure out. But I think that's important to note. If we're going to do this, let's do it right. Uh, and 
So that's one item. We were, I think, provoked to also move this forward by the reality that looking at next year's budget, with potentially 400 to 600 million dollars of surplus, including the school aid fund, um, what are we wanting to see in terms of budget priorities and make our recommendations? I think we are trying to uh, borrow from the guidance that we put together in terms of, and I'm going to page two, uh, the elements of what a, an effective education system requires from that prior document, knowing that three of our board members did not build in that set of understandings of what the key elements that we must fund are. And respecting that on the top of page two, uh, re trying to restate what are the goals for education in terms of key elements to fund. Uh, I We first tried to replay what was included in that 2010 document. Eileen and others suggested they're not totally comfortable with the wording or the criteria we had settled on. So the last two bullets, the first two bullets are the same. The last two bullets are now modified to reflect um, some suggestions, which I think I'm comfortable with, that we want to be able to pay for post-secondary achievement of a relevant certificate degree credential, not just two years. We don't want to pay for two years of college necessarily. And the last bullet is some statement that we need to be competitive with peer states about operational support for higher ed. Uh, which is, again, a way of saying, I mean, we're 49 out of 50 states in our support for higher education. So this would be a way to at least put some benchmark of target around being competitive with peer states, national averages. So that, that was a way to try to restate that. The next paragraph, eliminate, because it's duplicative of the, um, of the next paragraph. The State Board of Education's recommendations. Um, we're trying to say as we, again, rather more concisely for us and me than, than is the norm. The rest of this is basically given there's a surplus, given governor and legislature are making budgets for next year, given we're trying to provide some guidance on where the priority should be for those revenues, we're attempting to say a couple things. One is we do believe a combination of cost saving reforms and changes to the way revenues are raised and spent are important. We're noting many of the reforms have been enacted in this last year by the governor, by the legislature, and consistent with some of the recommendations we made at the beginning of the year. We're now eager to encourage priority to support key systems in education. Uh, and so we're also in the next paragraph that says the state constitution, trying to acknowledge there is very appropriate um, needs, including restocking the rainy day fund and other uses of any surplus. I would say we're we're bowing to that reality, and it's true. There are good uses. But then the last five bullets, really, are just saying, given that, yes, let's put some money somewhere in rainy day funds, but we would like, as a state board, potentially, to, to say a few things about priorities. A, we should invest a significant portion of any surplus in pre-K, K-12, and higher education, where it's important to invest. Oh, we would like to say, I would certainly like to have a say, those kinds of in, any investments in K-12 should um, reward and incent and encourage districts who have found cost savings by treating their legacy health and pension systems, by consolidating sharing services, who've made the reforms, they should be rewarded. So that funding should be um, linked to continuing reform. Uh, the, the last bullet says, in the context of providing adequate funding to all schools, we would like to build in a reward for student growth and achievement, which was part of our recommendations, part of Mike's encouragement. Let's reward growth and achievement in school funding. And that would be one sort of directional item that we might note. The last two were intended to be similar directional items, and we talked about one of them this morning. Uh, any K-12 investments Good investments should be targeted at the classroom, supporting teacher quality. I would note, you know, we recommended, we're supporting a third tier licensure master teacher. The governor has proposed same, investing to make that happen by paying for national board certification and things like that would be a very good investment of K-12 dollars. The last bullet was what we talked about earlier this morning, early college credit taking, uh, early colleges, middle colleges. It was designed exactly, Eileen, per your note, 
if we have some money and we want to invest it in K-12, here's a good place to put it. We endorse post-governor's, um, prior to governor's recommendation, post his announcement, support for early college credit taking in its multiple forms. I would personally welcome amending this to be specific, include, incorporate expanded uh, concurrent enrollment, dual enrollment, early middle colleges, IBAP. That's what this was intended to mean. So that's it. Uh, trying to, we haven't done the full analysis for next year. What are the elements of education that we want to see with the whole board? How do we pay for it? Uh, we want to do that, I hope, in the next year for the following year. We do have some potential guidance on where our priorities would be, particularly if we're seeing some revenues that we would potentially want to say we'd like to dedicate them to the P20 system, a significant share of those. And within that, here's some places to put them with uh, as a priority. That's, in general terms, what this is trying to say for next year as these budgets are getting cooked and going to be put to bed pretty soon. Eileen? I don't know how, how you want to take this, uh, John. I've got comments um, on the first part, uh, uh, under number two. Um, uh, I'm concerned that uh, the first and uh, the second and fourth bullets, K-12 state ed funding at funding level, sufficient to provide quality instruction. We may have trouble quantifying that because of um, the legacy costs and you know the the fact that we have issues trying to pay that. I'm sorry, where are you? I'm sorry, I'm on page. My cold and I are on page two, okay. and we're on bullet number two of the four that are at the top of the page. Okay. And then, um, so I had originally when I was talking to John, and I think I shout out to everybody, had proposed some alternate wording that was outcome-based for that. And I did the same thing for uh, the fourth bullet, higher ed operational support uh, at a peer level, because I'm worried that we may find that our peers have sunk lower than we are. Uh, so I'd rather have it based toward uh, things that work for Michigan, Michigan uh, uh, residents. And then on the very last um, bullet on, the page, on page three, I've just looked up on the um, Smarter Balanced Assessment uh, outline that Joseph gave us. And for uh, school year 2012 and 13, uh, one, uh, there are two things that are important to make sure they're funded. One is teams of teachers evaluate formative assessment practices and curriculum resources and formative tools available to teachers. So I'm concerned because it just so happens that that funding year is exactly when money needs to be available, and I, I am worried that we will fall flat on our faces with a very fine project if we don't have that money available to us. I recognize that there are ways to get at it, but I don't know how much it's going to cost, so I want to make sure we're thinking about that as we propose this. <coughs> Bullet four doesn't include, there, there's nothing in here about the implementation. Yes, I want to, it's the implementation of the Common Core uh, uh, Standards Project. I'm worried that because that particular, those tasks fall within that uh, funding year that we should be thinking about it. Before, I, mean, I think these are very helpful um, amendments or good changes. I guess, is, is there any broader commentary, like this is, we should do this, <laughs> this is in the right direction that anyone wants to make, or anyone says this is wildly in the wrong direction and I can't support any version of it? I guess it would be helpful for me and us if we get started. Kathleen and Nancy, Cassandra. Well, I was hoping that we would have been able to get some specific numbers by now, but we haven't, I guess. So that's it for what? To recommend how much we're talking and, and I think this is acknowledging we do not have that for this next year, but we should spend our, uh, we should make the make effort sure to succeed at that for the following year. I'm not Kath, may, on that for a moment, I'm not clear on what that means, numbers you thought you should have, so we can maybe help. Well, the cost of how much we are recommending that, that, that the, uh, if we could recommend what could be in the, in the foundation grant. Yeah. Can I, I know. Thing. The other thing is we, we talked about proposal A and maybe we should be looking at how that works yeah. in terms of supporting education and maybe making recommendations for changing, I guess tweaking is a bad word, but for improving that method. All right, may I just say on that 
point for a minute. I know we're repeating ourselves a little bit to say this, but and I don't know if the board wants to tackle this issue, but nine, pushing 90% now is salaries. And I think, I mean, when I've been asked this, it's hard to determine what the foundation should be unless you have some sense of a range for what salary should be. I mean, for example, I'm just showing my own bias here, but I think it's totally unacceptable that there's teachers in the UP with the same kind of challenges, especially in poor rural areas, and are making $37,000 tops. Totally unacceptable. On the other hand, we have two and a half times that in other districts in the state. So it's hard to say what the flat foundation should be if, you know, do we think 37,000 is good? Do we think 97,000 is good? Or maybe is there a range? I mean, I think it's it's the thing we it's the elephant in the room, pretty much every year when we keep when we keep looking for what that magic number is. I find myself this way. If I'm hit, I do fairly often at conferences. I do questions and answers, and almost always it's it's a money issue. And what what do you think the proper foundation should be? Well, tell me if it's thirty-seven thousand dollars. Tell me if a superintendent should be making three hundred, like I read in the paper this morning, for a relatively poor district, or whether a hundred and you know, 20 is appropriate. It, so I'm just saying it's the single biggest factor to determine whether or not the foundation is appropriate or not and what it should be would be at least some dialogue around that. You know, I don't know whether that's a range. I don't know if that's... Well, maybe and maybe that's part of the process. Yeah. I think that's a big issue. That we could should be part bake of into what we do next. These are yeah. issues and questions. We were a local control mm. state, quote unquote. Yeah. Uh, how much local control do we really want? You yeah. know, and that, that's, that's a, these are philosophical questions. Yeah. The other Go point I, I wanted to make was uh, in the middle of page two, we talk about the uh, combination of cost saving reforms and changes to the way revenues are raised and spent. Well, our original recommendation was that. Uh, we have cost savings and more efficient operations, but also that we needed additional revenue. And I think that's <coughs> new. That when you say changes to the way revenues are raised, it doesn't mention that we're going to need additional revenue. And, and, I don't and this is the broad euphemism that we use to say new taxes that we got support for. So that kind of language was lifted from what we were able to get support for on a bipartisan basis before, to acknowledge that uh, we do need to, to get additional revenue. Without saying it. I thought we said it. I was sure we said it. I didn't know we would change the real it this way. That was what everybody, when we had the presentations, we had six months of presentations by the Everybody from the Chamber of Commerce to liberal groups to the back of the center to every, if you remember, who was right and left and center, and every one of them recommended that we have additional revenue in addition to making everything more cost effective and efficient. No, I'm, uh, I certainly remember, Kath, and, and as you know, uh, extending the sales tax of services, uh, progressive income tax, all sorts of options, you know, I personally support. Um, we were, tr were trying to mimic some language, given where we are, of, that spoke to that need, uh, that uh, acknowledged that there's a revenue side and reform side, mm -hmm. and put those two together. Yeah. Nancy, please. Well, okay, I just wanted to make one thing. You know, yeah. the, ca the talk about uh, changes in the way revenues are raised, are always, they always come out, and it's going to be revenue neutral. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why it has to be revenue neutral. If we're changing the way, yeah. why do we come up with a and, and you noticed we're not saying that. So th this could be no, well maybe a, a window through which we can pour lots more, of new money. I'm forceful. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Answer, please. Cassandra? Um, to that, kind of to that point, I think it, 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 bears, uh, it bears repeating what our constitutional task is. We are tasked to tell them what education needs in the state. We are not tasked to tell them how. And I think the purpose of this, the purpose of this report, or the purpose of this constitutional fulfillment on the part of the board, is to make sure it's heard and acted on. And so I would, I would ask that, 
however we however we end up with this, one that it be credible, that we have support where we can have we can have footnotes that say based on the report of or based on analysis by or whatever it is, this is why we are making these statements. Based on the data reported to the department and the state, <coughs> we know that, blah blah blah, whatever it is. But it's got to be something that is credible in the eyes of those who will be making the decision. Whether we like it or not, it is the reality of the world we, deal, we, we live in. And so that's number one. Number two, if we say we need more money, we've got to be able to back it up as to why, and that's got to be credible too. But it is not our job, and the Constitution makes it very clear, to say how we get them up more money. So, Quite frankly, I don't want to do the legislature's work for them, but I do want to hold their feet to fire to get it done. And number three, I think we need to make certain that whatever we have asked for, again, we can say with certainty that we have spoken in terms of the whole state to the best of our ability and not some personal need, not, not our personal need, I don't mean that. We have heard from one group that says, I need this. We've got to be able as policymakers to look statewide and say, how does this fit into the whole realm of things? And yeah, there are individual pockets within the state that have needs different from everybody else. But I think we need to propose that in, in light of that. So that it's my big fear, and I know we've all heard this when we go and, look and we speak with legislators or other people in government or in business or in communities, yeah, you know what, this is what you guys say, but, I, you know, based on what, or you, you, I don't know what you guys are smoking, but that's not what I think is needed. I want to make this as airtight as we possibly can to say that there is some basis from which our recommendations come, and they are not individual, but they are statewide because we are a statewide body. So those are the concerns that I have, and I think that this gets at it largely, but as we move forward, I just want to make sure we get stay in that mainstream. So those, that's what I would ask we consider. Cassandra, please. Um, well, first of all, I want to say, Nancy, I agree with you. I think we need to keep it on a, a higher level. We need to be able to back up whatever we say. Um, I do think that on some level, though, unfortunately, there's probably going to be that what are you smoking mentality, <laughs> no matter what we say. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly, right. You have to be able to back it up. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say that a couple years ago when we went through this process, I personally found it very helpful um, and very informative and thought it was a really good process that we went through. And I would certainly be supportive of doing it again, um, bringing the different voices together. It was nice to have to be able to say that we listened to folks from everywhere from uh, the, the liberal side of the spectrum to the conservative side of the spectrum and everywhere in between and were able to come up with recommendations. So I, I think that was really good. And when you're ready for specific um, requests on the thing, I have just one. So. what we hear from people, we've got to go find out the facts that support what they say or refute what they Absolutely. say. Absolutely. Yeah. We can't just do it because they said it to us. And so, and I'm yeah. not saying you were saying that. No, no, no. Right, 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 right. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Thank you. Richard, please, and Eileen. Uh, John, the, the draft here reminds me of a great uh, educational painter. I think it was Horace Mann who, when asked directions, said, uh, go west, young man. He didn't say whether to take the Sauk Trail, the Santa Fe Trail, or the, or the route out of Independence, Missouri. Um, and uh, and, and that's, that was my response when I, when I read this. It's kind of aspirational, um, very little to quarrel with here. There are a few assumptions. I, I, I think the majority of the board is guided by a, a centralized view of of Michigan education, and I, I advocate more of a decentralized approach. So I, there are a few details like universal preschool, which I would not uh, support um, uh, generally. Um, but I, I would find it helpful, and I think it extremely useful, if we can, uh, maybe starting with uh, broad, just some statistical averages, 
for example, the average uh, the average teacher in Michigan, I know there's a wide range, maybe note the range, you know, is, receives uh, 50000 a year. Uh, the average classroom has uh, 28 students. Uh, since there are so many students in Michigan, we anticipate so many teachers, that implies so much money for classroom costs. The average school has uh, three and a half administrators uh, costing an average of so on and so forth. Maybe do some figures like that. Acknowledge that local districts have the right to adjust uh, as they see fit, but on the basis of a, of a rough equity uh, here and, and tied to specific numbers, I think at least that will give us a good starting place. And in terms of looking ahead at what we do to get a new look at all this. Yes, next year, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And it will also help us give perspective on, um, it, it might also get, help give perspective on an issue like universal preschool. If universal preschool is, uh, you know, going to be a 5% uh, uh, increase in, in, in uh, school budget spending, I think I'd object to that. On the other hand, if it turns out to be considerably less, maybe... Uh, if, if the cost in the big picture is smaller than I am thinking right now that it is, then I might drop my objection. So I think right. uh, having some notion of relative cost would be important. And, and just d that's why I was reminding us, those of us who went through before, that was exactly the kind of thing we got. You know, there are other new pieces we'd want to do when we do this again, I think. But that was the kind of estimations that we looked at. You know, how much does it cost? Here's a ballpark range based on different assumptions. You know, and that does inform. You know, okay, is that a good that we want to say? You know, we're comfortable advocating for. Um, are there other? I mean, Eileen, are there other global comments, or should could we move the document and then make some changes within it per the individual changes that people have re recommended? I, I'm afraid I was remiss by going right to specifics, but uh, John and I talked briefly yesterday afternoon. Um, the uh, the study the study scope is absolutely um, uh, Im uh, critical because uh, uh, at this point um, I'm not even sure we're building on on two year old information just because of the things that have come through. I mean, look, we're now looking possibly at a budget surplus. Who knows where we're going to be by the time this actually starts uh, taking off? You know, I have my fingers crossed. The cost, though, is another issue because um, that may impact this, the, the way that we react to the results. I, I'm reminded of people who go ahead and design a new house and they you know, cost the whole thing out and they get through with the builder and then they get to the carpet and there's no money left. So, um, or you know, forget furniture. Carpeting's nice, right? Or flooring. So uh, the, political, the, the politically expedient shortcut at the end of this with a 5-3 a split board could end up being something that not all of us would like. I just want to make really sure that we acknowledge that at the beginning. Um, okay, Nancy's done. Nancy says I'm done. <laughs> oh, okay, Nancy's moving on. Uh, so uh, the, the global take on this is that I'm, I am concerned because we don't have our own fiscal authorities or fiscal agencies and we have a one-time, one-shot project. We don't have the continuity and the staying power to keep on nudging this if the results start changing midstream. So, uh, you know, financial considerations in this state are about as volatile as they make them, and I don't want it to be a static one-shot situation where we're halfway through it, we discover that the parameters have changed and we can't react. That, that would be my concern. That's assuming the euro continues to <laughs> <laughs> stay afloat. Otherwise, we're all, we won't have any surplus. And, and I guess, you know, I, we talked, and I think we're all committed, I'm certainly committed to move ahead with next year's work conditioned on having support and getting help to do it right and well incredibly in ways that we're all comfortable and that engage in the kind of process and data and support which you know we've, we've shown we can do and I'm confident we can do again if if we end up not getting there we'll recognize it and call it for what it is if you're comfortable C could I get a motion to approve this document and then we can make some changes within it if you support it was moved by Marianne. It was supported by Cassandra. Thank Discussion. You. Um, and then I heard several changes. I guess I would at welcome uh, putting in into the last bullet, just enumerating uh, early college, middle college, AP, IB, 
dual enrollment, perhaps under after post-secondary credentials uh, through expanded and name those programs would be one, uh, if you're willing to make it explicit, this is what we're thinking funding can go to. Eileen, if I heard you correctly, I thought under the previous bullet you were looking for a way, I thought it might fit the, the teacher training or teams of teachers as another element under how to expand teacher quality. I mean, it could fit there, I think, or was it somewhere else that you wanted to put that? It can, but it's support for the Common Core assessment um, uh, implementation, and it, it needs to be stated as that specifically, uh, in, in part because it may not require much in the way of resources. It may be that there are federal funds, so we could take it out later on, but I, I think we really have to identify that. That's the biggest thing that's happening in assessment here in how many years? Uh, since maybe 2002, since NCLB. Support for Common Core assessment implement standard implementation process, including illustrations of same. Are there another bullet? Uh, well, it's, it's uh, teacher training. Um, Joseph is still here. I don't know, Joseph. Can you, with your comment, with your Smarter Balanced, uh, there's specific language in here for 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 tasks that are to be performed. But I don't know that we want to list those. There's two of them. Uh, yeah, the uh, teams of teachers evaluate formative assessment practices and curriculum resources and formative tools available to teachers are the two milestones that are listed in here. And that's what I would be concerned about is making sure that there's adequate support for teachers statewide to understand what they need to do and how to use those tools. Para pros, teachers, guidance counselors. I did. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, the uh, the first. So if we're dealing with the last paragraph and four bullets behind it, um, the first bullet, uh, the significant portion of any budget surplus be invested in. Um, I would actually change pre-K to early childhood, but uh, Dr. Z and I, I think are probably on this particular issue uh, at opposite ends of the spectrum. Our early childhood K-12 and higher ed um, as a budget priority for next year. I would I would like to see that sentence or that bullet because it's not a specific investment tied to education as the others are. I'd like to see it actually moved into the paragraph. Um, so we say we recommend to the governor and legislature that I would insert that bullet language there that a significant portion of any budget surplus yada 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 specifically colon one two three Eileen's bullet is four. Um, so that we have specifics enumerated underneath the general recommendation. Uh, the second thing is consistent with um, what Eileen is up to, <laughs> and John, what you're up to. No, with with uh, making specific kind of specific <laughs> reference to uh, to the um, uh, Common Core assessment or uh, dual enrollment, so on and so forth, is around the second bullet what would now be the second bullet, currently the third, K-12 investments that provide adequate funding to all schools should also serve to reward schools that demonstrate progress on student growth and achievement. I think we should actually re reference there um, the uh, ESEA waiver request that by then will have been submitted, so on and so forth. So we actually want to create funding to support rewarding the reward schools as contemplated in the MDE waiver ESEA funding or waiver request. Cassandra. Uh, staying in the same area, um, what is now the first bullet, which was previously the second bullet, uh, which says K-12 investments should financially reward schools and districts that have found cost savings in non-instructional services, such as through school consolidation, shared services, and changes to legacy pension and benefit systems for employees. I would suggest that we simply say, such as through school consolidation and shared services, period, and remove the last part, changes to legacy pension and benefit systems for employees, for two reasons. One, I believe legacy pension costs fall outside the scope of local schools and districts. It's a state. Yeah. They pay too much exactly. But they don't get to decide what they pay. That's not up to them. No, go ahead. The reason why I recommended this to be mentioned is that currently local districts are required to pay X amount of dollars to pay down their donated costs. 
Mm -hmm. or to put in for those services. But my proposal would be that the state be, first of all, if we have if we have a surplus next year, let's hope not. But it could be a one-time surplus. It could be a one-time finding of extra funds. So whatever we recommend, I think we have to recognize that this could be a one, what you want to do and what most districts when they have extra funds some year. They try and find things if they're economically, if, if, if they're doing their good, their good fiduciary responsibility, they look for one-time costs, not ongoing costs, because you're not guaranteed ongoing funding. Right. So if you develop a plan whereby, because of our newfound funds this year, that we can't guarantee for next year, we told districts that the state would now put in X amount of dollars per, per district to pay for these legacy costs, and you only have to pay them this much this year. They still get the same amount of money per pupil, but instead of having to send some of it back to the state, now they can keep it in the district, and they can use it for whatever they decide in their district they could use. Maybe it's, I don't know, new computers. Maybe it's a new transportation system. Maybe it's whatever it is. But it's a one-time cost situation, and the state is giving them more money by paying for something the state traditionally has to pay for this year, not in total, but in part. And so that's why, what I had envisioned there, because that's a one-time situation. That's not something that you would then be locked into for the following year, and then we don't have new money. There's nothing worse for programs, and you know this in your, so, in your fundraising with what, what you do. There's nothing worse than trying to develop a program that doesn't have ongoing support, and it only has one-time support. You get this big push the first year, and the second year you have to say, we can't do that again. And I, I, I'm try that's what I was trying to think of. I guess I don't understand how that... I'm looking at the first part. It says, K-12 investments should financially reward schools and districts that have found cost savings in non-instructional services. Yeah, because that that's not a financial that's you're not financially rewarding a school because no, it's yeah. not up to the school. No. Yeah, you're right. it's, but that's what I thought you meant that because they didn't have a say as to how much they didn't have to pay the state that wasn't. No, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm yeah. saying you you can't financially reward a school for something they don't have control over. Right, and that's you're right. I don't think it should be part of that. I think it should be its own separate thing. So. That's fine. Uh, um, the second part is the benefit systems for employees. This was built into legislation this year and and uh, employees took a huge hit as a result of um, the 80-20 and all of that so I, I don't want to be in a position where we're, we're going back and saying once again that wasn't enough cut them some more and then let's can I can I all right then the problem is it's tied to something it's not related to okay you're saying potentially, for example, put put 200 million in the retirement fund, and instead of paying 20 some percent, they're paying 19 percent. Right. Or whatever. And that's, I can agree with that's that. That's different than what. That's completely say. different from. What can we say here? Well, you, you gotta get rid of that and make it a separate bullet. Make a separate bullet and say it to that effect. What does it say? The separate bullet. Okay. <laughs> then maybe you could say something about rewarding districts that. Uh, collectively bargain changes to the employee benefit system would be a more um, um, helpful way to say that. But I, but I think mm -hmm. Corsair is right. It's, they did that already. They've done it. I mean, how, how much I more? Really have to I, yeah, I wish they'd started doing it then. Yeah, I, I think you're talking two different things. The, the, the employee benefits, they did take a hit already. It's the 80-20. The retirement. See, the I think the hardest thing for a school district to explain is you is is even if you get an increase in your foundation, if your retirement costs have gone up so much that suddenly, I mean, the average person can't believe that we're almost at a quarter of the payroll mm -hmm. is is yeah. thrown into something that you don't even have for your kids to use in your district today. It's just incomprehensible. So I think the, the superintendents and the principals and the boards have this very difficult time of explaining, oh, my gosh, yeah, we got that increase, but we've gone up this much. And often you'll hear it put like, well, it went up a percent and a half. It went up a percentile and a half. 
which can be in that case 8% or something. So they're getting a cut on the foundation and they're getting an increase of 8% that they have to throw into the into the pension costs. It's like and the worst of all. I was all. thinking we could reward them by saying, okay, we're going to pay part of that cost. It'll be a small part. You want to? Are you Instead working of, on a bullet? Yeah. I think. All the, I think. What <laughs> Sorry, we're I think to I do is that's okay. Take out the benefit system because I agree with you. The benefit system isn't what we're after. It's the pension piece that the state has, or that the district has to pay back to the state. And so I, I think that that's something that we need to say, and I wish I had a legal hat to put on. While you're doing that, Richard, and then we'll... And what about... John, do you, excuse me one second, do you have timing issues on this? I mean, I'm, if you want to do it, I don't mean to stop this, if you think this is helpful. You could put it in the same. But there's, I'm just thinking out loud, I mean, this is December. Um, I personally think we need to do it, finish it now. I think we're close to okay. enforcing it just because yeah. budgets are going to bed and it would be you know, helpful. To okay. Get to we should them. finish it now. I'm, I'm on the same paragraph. And um, the K-12 investment should financially reward schools and districts that have found cost savings on social services and school endowments. I, it's not clear to me why we need to incentivize this when saving is its own reward. It, it makes sense to like to buy uh, maybe to incentivize uh, insulation, which is going to cut down on your heating bill, but there's an initial cost up front. It makes sense to incentivize that so you can save money in the long run. But it just seems to me that um, uh, we don't need to re-incentivize these kinds of savings, uh, and maybe there's something else that we can reward. Um, I don't know. I mean, we've not. It's been hard to get serious consolidation shared services change. So what this is saying is a little different from the initial strategy. Instead of cutting you four hundred or five hundred dollars to force you, uh, require you to make change, is if you make changes, find two hundred million dollars in you know shared service costs. We're going to you know, give you the same amount in the foundation grant as we would. Uh, we're not. We won't cut you. Uh, so it, it, it's it's holding them harmless or providing a sweetener so that they can essentially move money from a place where it's a bad use I can, you know, yeah. into something better like instructing kids. I, I, can, I can certainly support that. Dan, please. Uh, just because I'm not going to type out an email, Nancy. Um, <laughs> 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 I'm wondering if... If uh, it, it, this could be as simple as the insertion of a phrase uh, in that bullet, so it says maybe K-12 investment should financially reward schools and districts, comma, perhaps through contributions to legacy pension systems, comma, um, to their legacy pensions, um, comma, that have found cost savings in non-instructional services. Just as one, right, possible way to reward schools and districts. I think Except I'd like it to be a request more than a perhaps. Sure, sure, sense. sure. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. I, but, but could I it still be its own bullet though? Yeah. yeah. Just yeah. to keep it clean. Sure. Were there more and Eileen, you had a couple more I didn't want to not pay attention to the uh, uh, in the language that we settled on at the top of page two from last year where I tried to change the last two bullets respecting your recommendation. The, the second bullet is the big fudge bullet where it's a total fudge statement, K-12 aid at funding level sufficient. We couldn't improve upon it in the last go round. I think in our um, next effort, we might be able to do better. What, is the, what, what does that mean? So that's the same. Uh, this, the third and fourth, I was trying to make different from what we said before, more outcome oriented. Um, I, I would consider. I would consider leaving out the second one completely because we're either going to come up with something or else we aren't. I'm serious. Um, I, it could be that we come up with components that we think are really important to fund, that we, that we can say with total credibility this really needs to be funded at this level, but that we may not say something. I, mean, I don't know how you can come up with a number for general ed given that we don't have ongoing analysis uh, and that this is a one-time shot. Uh, it's a picture, a snapshot, as opposed to, you know, I, so I would just consider leaving it out. We can, you can discuss it. But for, th for the third bullet, what I had proposed was access and support for students to graduate career-ready from post-secondary or technical training. 
And the reason that I put that in is because I don't, I mean, I'm looking at the, the problems that the feds have had with um, Pell Grants and with uh, guaranteed student loans, and I don't think there's enough resources in the state to promise post-secondary education financial support for all citizens. So, you know, I was just looking at a broader picture of making sure that people can get to a community college or get to online or get to whatever it takes, knowing that the cost of that could vary wildly. And then for the, the last one, higher education operational support, again, I didn't feel that we could quantify that. They have their own lobbyists. They're doing a good job of it. And instead, I suggested something like post-secondary funding levels appropriate so colleges, universities, and community colleges can provide the opportunities Michigan citizens need for lifelong learning, employability, and citizenship. Thanks. They're still general, but they're not as fuzzy, I guess. Were there other changes? Mike, did you have any other thought or recommendations or changes? Just on your first point, um, I think we would want to use ECS, NASB, MREL. There are ways we can help assist with specific questions, kind of in the spirit of what Nancy said before. Sometimes it might, it, the, it might be our job here at this table once in a while is to identify a concrete, specific question. And then I'm telling you, we found out with Emerald when we used them to race to the top, they're sitting there waiting for someone to ask for their help. I mean, whole research teams. Mm -hmm. So I meant to say this last meeting also, but I think we have a real opportunity. They're, they're just underutilized. We knew from when uh, Randy, or, uh, uh, Randy from ECS? Suddenly drawing a blank. Yeah, Randy from ECS came in. They're just waiting. They were literally just waiting. So I didn't want to not mention that, that we could work together on trying to craft some projects that you think um, serve at the states, look internally in Michigan, and they'll help us with. The only other, I kind of said it already, but I don't think I said it very well, is the, the, more, the worst nightmare for a district is to get what's perceived to be an increase, and then they really don't get anything approximating that because the retirement eats it up. So you'd almost do them a better favor mm -hmm. by subsidizing some of the retirement, yeah. and then in turn, they can at least say, to subsidize that, they probably didn't get as much of an increase, for instance, but at least they can say, well, it's, I don't know, it's hard to explain that you supposedly got a 2% increase and you really don't have 2% because 8% went in the retirement. So I'm, because Peter, <laughs> right. But it, it, this was a deal crafted years ago. You could see it coming. I wrote an article 20 years ago or whenever that was that, wait till it, because remember, the, the, the foundation was moved up X amount to, to, to equate to what the retirement was at the time, but you could just see what was going to happen to the retirement was going to go like this, and it wasn't going to be keep pace. So now it's suddenly, I mean, it's 20, what's the percent? Judy, Bruce, someone help me. It's 20-some percent for the retirement in a district. 25%. So, I mean, it's just, it's so unbelievable. And then the harder part is trying to explain when you have these budget hearings with your community that you really didn't get an increase. You'd almost be better off not getting an increase and getting that subsidized if worse came, if worse came to shove. So, so I'm only... should say that. You know, the state should subsidize the uh, retirement. Yeah. I was just trying to support that. John asked if I support it. This all sounds good to me. But I, and I, and I, I don't think it's necessarily has a place in here at this time. But I really think you'd make a big contribution. We would yes, together we if we. We've been trying, saying this for years. That this was a problem. Right. I, I'm just saying a, 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 maybe it's after this project. But I think a big contribution would be some dialogue about um, salary issues. Okay. Somewhat controversial, but ranges even because. I'm thinking even at the low end. I just don't know how we rationalize as a department and a state board that some teachers make so little in parts of this state. It's not just the other end. And so there might be a range that we would, I mean, I don't know what new data is, for example. I bet if we gave Emerald a project and said, what is it that a career engineer makes now in, in, in this era, 2011? I'm sure it's changed to some degree based on global issues based on the way the auto industry works. 
So, I mean, you'd at least have something. I think this can be a boost for teachers at some point because if you constantly feel like you're underpaid, and in some cases they really are, that can be <coughs> part of the feeling of bashing. Whereas if you start to realize, well, you know what, compared to an engineer, I'm actually doing better than I thought. I, I'm just saying I think there's a contribution to be made that's concrete um, to study that and look at what professions are making comparably. And Can you offer this as far as mm -hmm. the question of cost? Given the potential of the surplus in the state coffers, the state pay a district percentage of the legacy cost currently paid for by each district, allowing each district to realize whatever true increase in foundation grants is supported in the coming budget year. Can you repeat that one more time? No. Given the potential of a surplus in the state coffers, the state pay a district percentage of the legacy cost currently paid for by each district, allowing each district to realize whatever true increase in foundation grants is afforded in the coming budget year. Sounds good to me. Yeah. It's approved. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm sorry, what? Pay school districts a percentage? No, they're going to pay the school district's percentage right directly into so they're paying a flat amount, in effect, and it would reduce. And there may be a better way of saying that, but that was my intent. Just say it again. Pay, okay. pay a district, pay district percentage. Pay, pay, pay district percentage. Does the state resume paying a portion of the retirement fund costs or the legacy costs? Because they used to pick it all up. I know. If you took some of that surplus if it exists and put, I'm just stabbing, but for the sake of discussion, $200 million into that, it would reduce what the districts had to pay. Right. And would also not make it look like, well, you got an increase, why can't you pick up the bill? Well, they didn't realize that increase doesn't even cover your retirement. It's a real, it's a real increase then, or if it's not an increase, at least they're not defending something that they can't defend. How about if we say it this way? Given the potential of a surplus in the state coffers, the state will pay for all districts a percentage of the legacy cost currently paid for by each of those districts, allowing each district to realize whatever true increase in foundation grades is afforded in the coming budget year. Does that work? Why, why potential? I mean, we know for sure. Well, we don't know. We don't. Well, the, the, all these items work. We don't work. know what the potential is. I mean, maybe it's... Well, it's Two billion, maybe it's two point five billion, maybe it's one no, point nine seven billion. Well, why not Although just you say we're given uh Oh I am willing to put in a mount, but I just I didn't want no, to make no. that judgment. I actually I'll take it out because we referenced it earlier. Yeah, all of these bullets yeah, are conditioned say, on the there being money. Yeah, so you don't need the right. given oh, you can okay. just say all the right. I, see what yeah. you're I thought you meant you want me to put a particular amount. No. So that would be another yeah. bullet. And I think you should change coffers. It sounds lethal. <laughs> right. Given, thank you, everybody. Can we? Um, <laughs> with that change and the other changes that we've agreed on, would the motioners accept those changes? And with Marianne and Cassandra. Yeah. yeah. What, what changes are we talking about? Well, we made quite a few. Right. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to get this all watered down. Where I don't think we watered no, things no, down, Marianne. I, we, 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 I think, Mar Marilyn, you have got the language. We could also <laughs> make sure to circulate it again uh, <laughs> after we approve it before it goes out anywhere to make sure people, where every, everybody has a last chance to look at it. But I think we made changes in um, just moving through. We, there's there's two comprehensives in the first paragraph on page two at the end, so one comprehensive needs to go. Um, we are restating those bullets, eliminating the next paragraph. We also reiterate. Uh, in the next paragraph, we're inserting the first bullet as a sentence after legislature in the last sentence, saying specifically, I'm on the second page, the paragraph before the end, before the bullets start. Right. We're saying specifically the following budget priorities for next year. Uh, the first one then becomes K-12 investments should financially reward schools and districts to, that 
have found cost savings in non-instructional services, such as through, through school consolidation shared services, period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then we have Nancy's bullet, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Then we have K-12 investments provide adequate funding, which also serves to reward schools to demonstrate progress on student growth and achievement as contemplated and defined in MDE's ESEA waiver request. And then we have new K-12 investments should be targeted classroom. That bullet is the same. We have in the next bullet, in addition of um, after post-secondary learning opportunities and better plan for and realized post-secondary credentials through expanded dual enrollment, early middle college, IB and AP programs. And then a last bullet, support for common core standards and assessment implementation, including te teacher training. And there were a couple other items there. Right. Administrator. Teacher and administrator. So there were a couple other items there. So those are the changes. Okay. In now, did we drop any points? No. Oh, okay. So we're not good at adding that. <laughs> <laughs> I have a we just dropped a paragraph that was accidentally repeating. Okay. John? Yeah. Uh, toward the bottom of it, the, the end of the first part, on the first page, it has planning and target dates to guide this process to be filled in. Do you have those? No, and the staff and others thought they could provide some help on helping us map through the year, but we don't have those yet. I think it's fine to leave them. We, we need to fill those in. We need to put meat on this process. I think what we're saying is we're going to try to move ahead in this process as defined if we can fund it and support it seriously is what we're saying in this resolution. And now will you send out a uh, mm -hmm. resolution? Okay. Okay. Thank so you, everybody. Uh, well, I need the vote, right? Yeah. See what happens. So we had a motion by Mary Ann, supported by Cassandra. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Great. Good job. Okay. Uh, as brief as you can be, uh, Lisa, you're always in this spot. I don't think they acted today. It looks like tomorrow or something, but you would know better. If you've been watching. I brought the charter bill. I thought I'd go through it page by page. <laughs> <laughs> no? Oh, okay. Let's call on dinner. <laughs> yeah. Can I ask one question, though, speaking of the charter bill? When is it actually going to be up on the web, what the, what the House did? Um, after they vote on it? <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> the way the system works is they put, they put substitutes up when a chamber passes it in order to get the sub, you need to get a hold of the sponsor's office or one of the members. Um, I don't have this, the current sub, but I have the old sub and the amendments that were added to it. So combined, you can figure out what the committee did. Um, but no, I mean, that's always been the frustration of the system. The members mm. have access to it internally, but until the substitute is adopted on the floor, it's technically not an official document, so it doesn't show up on that legislature webpage. Okay. I know it's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, please. Um, number one, today the bullying bill was signed by the governor about an hour ago. Uh, this is the um, House passed version that did not include the controversial language that was included in the Senate. <coughs> the um, House Education Committee has changed a little bit. As you know, one of the members is no longer in the legislature, so instead we have Chairman Tom McMillan. And he's from Rochester Hills. And uh, in addition, they shuffled around a few other members. Um, Holly Hughes is not on the committee anymore, uh, but John Bumstead and Lisa Postumus Lyons was added, were added. The partisan makeup is the same, but the members have changed. The, the bill related specifically to the charter um, traditional public school academy cap um, is expected on the floor at some point soon but i haven't heard when whether that this week next week um, but it is expected to be passed then it goes to the senate for concurrence and to the governor um, there's I, I don't know when or or if there's going to be any further changes on the floor at this point i do have some of the highlights if you want me to go through that. Um, I wasn't sure how much in depth we wanted to go. If not, um, I can email that to you later. Um, it, it's up to you. Pleasure of the board. Sure. Well, I can get it. Maybe you can email it. I heard rumors that they might not have enough votes to get the capital. Can you put anything close to that? Yep. 
Uh, yes, there are rumors that there's um, a shortage. The shortage is so close to passage, though, my guess is that there will be arm twisting and deal making, and in the end, uh, the bill will go through. Now, having said that, uh, you know, it, until the vote happens, you just never know what's going to happen, whether there'll be changes, whether it will be, um, uh, whether, whether the deals being made relate specifically to language in this bill or to completely unrelated issues. That's all the part that we um, wait to see how it all unfolds. And, but, that, but that is the rumor. I haven't heard any rumors about specific changes to the bill, just that um, they were having difficulty coming up to the number 56. Cassandra, please. Oh, I'd certainly like to get an email, but I just want to know from you, um, based on your review, do you think there are any major changes to the substitute as opposed to what was passed in the Senate? One of the things that was put in in the committee is something that we had discussed at the um, legislative committee and that um, I worked with Brad Billadu from MASA and Representative Shaughnessy uh, pushed, which had to do with, if you can remember, um, all school districts have to have that mitten icon that has the financial data. And one of the complaints was the, the, because charters contract a lot more, everything shows up under contract and you couldn't sort of piece out, well, what of that is a food service contract and what of that is a teacher, what is going to instruction? And language was added to the sub that came out of committee that gets at that so that that information, so that their, their mitten icon will have when you look at their pie chart, it will be an apples to apples. It, does that make sense? It's, it's With kind traditional. Of, right, as, as traditional public schools. So at least in terms of transparency, they were able to get some additional pieces in. That was probably one of the biggest changes. The other one was um, in the initial version, a, a community college could charter anywhere in the state, not just Bay Mills, whose district is the entire state, but say, LCC could have gone to anywhere. anywhere. And in the version that came out of committee, community colleges are limited to their geographic district. Those are. Darn McComb was ready to go to Muskegon. The, I'll send you the bullets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I don't think there's many. Well, community, community colleges, colleges are currently do, not do limited they? at all. There is no cap on community college or tr uh, traditional districts chartering. There never has been. It's only on university charter. Okay, so, so, um, there's, there's nothing changed there. so nothing's changed to that, but um, the changes have to do with university cap, um, with collective bargaining pieces, um, with the um, a lot to do with the transparency and the accountability pieces. Um, those are the big. Currently, if a traditional public school, a tr traditional public district wants to charter a school, the charter school ha would have to immediately be under the exact same, yeah. and this would remove that. Mm -hmm. Other comments, questions? For Dan? Uh, one other comment, um, so I, I am not privy to the inner workings of the House and so I don't know how it will, will all play out in terms of vote gathering and arm twisting and the like, but uh, my understanding is that Senator Pavlo um, will be convening a, uh, a group to work on um, accreditation issues post all of this, and that's part of the deal making going on, uh, that um, in other words, if your concern is kind of a front end standard as mine was um, around the removal of the cap, don't worry, we'll talk about that and other issues dealing with accreditation um, after this. Uh, and so he's agreed to convene some group um, at some point after passage of this bill, assuming that it does pass. Just FYI. Well, so presumably, I, 
obviously all of this will be impacted a little bit by waiver requests and you know and other things going on uh, with the Department of Ed. But I'm assuming that he's talking um, what we would consider traditional accreditation issues, MISAS, and you know other things uh, of that nature. Plus this whole issue around the front end, whether there needs, should should be a front end standard that would keep the worst uh, uh, charter schools from replicating, um, uh, or or would somehow incentivize or only allow the, the better or higher performing charter schools to replicate. I'm a, little, I'm a little confused by this. How do you, you do that without going through the law making process? No, so that would, I, I think he'd be convening folks to ask for input on drafting some legislation to be subsequently oh, introduced. Okay. I don't know. I okay. So, what's the department's accreditation legislation? That, right. Is that is that the MISAS? Yeah, MSA, Michigan School Accreditation. MISAS is not. That's it's not a previous. It, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all that they'd need to do is the committee would just need to concur with your approval. They wouldn't even need to get the whole House or Senate, right? It's a committee level now. Under the Any other? I know the weariness is setting in. We good? And you'll email that one piece that Cassandra talked about. Cool. The only other thing that I wanted to note left in the report was the legislative committee had recommended to the full board um, a proposed statement regarding the cyber charter bill, um, which was in my report. It talks about the fact that uh, proposed virtual schools should only be, uh, additional schools should only be allowed upon satisfying the following two conditions. Review of the two years of performance data from two current, from the two current virtual schools as required by current law and uh, clear plans and capacity to implement these schools for holding virtual schools to the same requirements for student achievement, achievement growth and outcomes as all public schools and for full participation in school accountability, data collection and assessment systems. Um, I'm not sure if Nancy as the chair of the legislative committee wants to say anything else, but that was the, the legislative committee's recommendation to the full board. Only, no, you said it very well. Only that we wanted to bring it before the board and I didn't know if I needed to wait till the next because we didn't have it on the agenda, so we needed to wait to the next meeting to do that, or if you want to take it up now. I think we have to take it up yeah. now. Just take it up now. Right. It would seem to me that we would, but we're just going to keep it So, yes. Yeah, We've done that before. Sure. We've taken based mm -hmm. on things that have come up during yeah. this part. So if you'd like to. I would recommend that. Uh, I would recommend that the board consider the legislative committee recommendation regarding cyber I can also move it. But I certainly recommend you yep. take it up. <laughs> so moved. Yeah. It was moved by Cassandra. S support. Supported by John. Discussion? Well, I would like to say what you said. You didn't say it quite the way it's written. Oh. Um, the way it says here is that we support additional proposed virtual schools only upon satisfying the right. But it starts off saying we support additional proposed, and I would say we would not support additional schools unless these things are. I think so. One half a dozen in the other. But no, I think it's different. I don't want it. I don't want it to. Uh, like they could take off the. They could take the first part of the sentence and just drop the second part. That's say I mean, it's the papers. Well, so of course they could, but they could take. They could take the first. Well, there's, there's a motion in support. And, and you said it differently. I'm trying to think of what you said. As opposed to we don't support it unless, or we support only. How about we only support? Yeah, we only support. We only support. Okay. I think that makes it better. <laughs> so we only support if is the, and then call in. 
Any further discussion? feel better because I was put on the spot a little bit at lunchtime and what totally consistent. <laughs> I, I was put on I was put on the spot and I knew that this is what the committee said so I'm glad you're taking action so I'm not hanging there alone. All in favor aye. Aye. Opposed same. Great because it really isn't smart to do that without another year of study on this other one. I don't, I don't get it. So let's we'll, we'll we'll get that also to the committee today. Um, I have an email address. Oh, okay. Thanks, Lise. <laughs> Good. I, can I move the consent agenda approval? Of the consent agenda. Moved by John. Support. Supported by Dan. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, same. Comments by State Board. Eileen, Mo Kathleen. Uh, no, I'm not going away. <laughs> I, I am going away, but not. I wanted to briefly report on the. <laughs> okay, I wanted to briefly report on the uh, National Assessment Governing Board meeting because it has some things that are important to us. Uh, yes, indeed, the uh, uh, TUDA results will be uh, released tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, and I would like to ask the staff to review them with us briefly as an agenda item in January including um, the, uh, there, there is a section, uh, I think that the uh, background questions that apply to Detroit uh, that will be on the internet um, might be useful for just thinking things through a little bit, especially for teacher prep institution issues. And then in general, we, we had a, an agenda item scheduled that consisted of a, an hour and a half with Secretary Duncan, um, uh, the, uh, the man who runs PISA, uh, and uh, a representative from the Council of, of uh, Great City Schools and uh, Katie Haycock, and it boiled down to Great City Schools and Katie Haycock. But uh, in general, what we're trying to do is to make uh, come up with more things that are actionable. One of the discussions that came up that I, I mentioned to Joseph was that it turns out that this year um, we did give NAEP, I think in fourth grade and possibly in eighth, to a pool of kids that had both the reading and the math assessments, which means that for the first time we may be able to pull out data for N from NCES that shows whether kids who can read informational text well do better on math, which would be huge, uh, being able to inform schools that that's, that's what we know, all know it's important, but we're not doing anything about it. And uh, overall, what, what we've been told uh, from the, <coughs> excuse me, from the 2011 NAEP reading and math results is that kids don't read informational text well. So overall, the results of uh, the, the NAEP for both reading and math were flat. Uh, because kids who started taking NAEP uh, 30 years ago had higher scores in reading than in math, and we, we know how to do math instruction better than we know how to do reading, the math scores have been rising, but reading has been stagnant. So um, uh, Michelle Ree said, was quoted in all of the NAGB documents as saying that that is the issue. Teachers tell her it's easier to quantify how to teach math than it is how to teach reading be uh, better than we're doing right now. And um, that's really it overall. I've also sent all of you an email with um, the What Works Clearinghouse from the, um, uh, the Institute of Education Sciences, uh, which uh, I think would bear some looking at for districts who are looking for quantifiable ways to improve student uh, outcome. Thanks. Thank you, Ellen. <laughs> Kathleen? Mary Ann and Carolyn Curtin and I attended the Michigan Virtual University program last night honoring the online teacher of the year. And it was, the teachers were terrific. Uh, the online teacher of the year is Julia Schwartz, who's from uh, Maple Valley Schools. She's been a teacher for 44 years. And she became an expert at online at, at teaching and she reported on what her relationships with, with students. And it was a terrific presentation. She was very, very impressive. And the, the runner-up was a teacher for 30 years. So it was interesting to me. And the, other, the third one was a six or seven years. But it wasn't that, you know, there's so much talk about the older teachers may not be able to keep up with mm -hmm. the digital age. And these were veteran teachers who were good teachers, 
who became good online teachers as well. And uh, it was very interesting, so instructive. Uh, they, they make a big thing about their relationships with their students, that they have a very close, they don't know them if they run into them on the, at the mall, as she does her right, classroom yeah. students, because she doesn't know their faces, but she knows their, their hearts and their minds, because they do a lot of writing. She's an English language arts teacher, mm -hmm. so she does a lot of reading of, of their thoughts and of their ideas and their aspirations and what have you. But it was very impressive, and uh, it, it's encouraging to know that there are teachers who do make the transition, right. and they can be very helpful, I think, to us in how to help other teachers become more expert at, at uh, online or digital learning and incorporating it into their everyday teaching. Yeah. Thank you. And we were fortunate to have Carolyn join us. Yeah, thanks Carolyn for coming today. And she's yeah. been here the whole day. I mean, she misses us so much. We were more efficient when you were on the board. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I had the fun of attending the uh, MDE's uh, hearing on um, uh, teacher and uh, administrative uh, credentialing. I held at Wayne Rees on November 16th. And uh, I, I witnessed that rap, which uh, mentioned you and uh, a few others. And um, I, was, I was deeply struck by the lack of, uh, let me put it this way, anxiety in the system. And I suppose it's not surprising after the anxiety in the system, um, there was a lot of, of um, deep distrust of administrators who would evaluate a uh, teacher and um, uh, uh, that is that is uh, and a lot of false statements including uh, someone who said that the you know DMD doesn't even care and you know Sally Vaughan wasn't even there and of course you were sitting right there in the back uh, by a she's in disguise an that's why she did, they didn't know she was there by an EMU uh, professor of education, and um, uh, and and it really strikes me that uh, the challenge of the, the challenge of um, being clear uh, with facts, so that people are, are people's fears are not stoked, um, and what we can do to help build trust in the system. Part of that trust is simply predictability, knowing what the rules are, knowing what to expect next year. Um, and that's where both unfounded hopes and unfounded threats undermine trust. Um, so what, what we can do to make things predictable to be realistic, I think, in our goals as well. Um, but I, I think we have a role to play in, uh, in building trust and speaking well of, um, uh, of those who are committed to Michigan's children. And I uh, just wanted to share that with you. Thought, if I may add, I thought it's interesting that some of the associations that didn't want student achievement data as part of an evaluation, I think teachers and others are now getting because of this undue fear. Most principals are caring and want to help and support their teachers. So, but because of the fear that I could arbitrarily be made ineffective, they're actually realizing now it's blessing in disguise that this is going to include student achievement. I'm so the very thing we were fighting for before, we're not going to get credit for this, by the way, just <laughs> the way the world works, you know, you, they forget all that, but it's actually helping and will help calm this down because it's not just about one person's thinking. If you get growth, I mean, we'll see what the model turns out to be exactly, but it's going to have to get growth in it. Good teachers, most teachers are going to be able to demonstrate growth and that's going to take half their value. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because it did strike me at the time. They're all complaining about the the in-house evaluation and no one brought up the, the the student performance piece which originally was the controversial yeah, aspect. Yeah, no, it's, it's flipped. Yeah. It's flipped because of... Yes, ma'am. Well, you know, this whole business about evaluation that report I gave you from NASB yes. gives some, some elements of a good evaluation system and that it's re we really have to get across to the teachers that it's supposed to be a support to them and how to help them do better 
and be more effective teachers rather than a punishment. And I know that there are legislators who talk about we want an evaluation system so we can get rid of all these terrible teachers. But and, and they hear that. So, but if we could, if, and if this council that you're a member of could get across that it, it's, a, it's a method of, of helping teachers do their jobs better. Right. Yeah. Uh, giving them support. It also means a lot of training for the administrators who actually do the evaluations. Right. That's a very big part of this. And it's right. not just one, one of the observation in the classroom and, you know, and that. It's yes. the whole process for the whole, the whole semester. Right. Well, for, Richard, and yeah. if I may respond, I, we have sometimes been a part of that. When we say the most influential thing in the student's success is having a good teacher, the implication is to improve student success, you've got to eliminate some bad teachers. Okay, and I know that's not what anyone had in mind when they said it, but uh, just as I put my foot in my mouth about Grand Valley State, uh, we, <laughs> we may, uh, there may be implications to some of the things we throw out that we're not always cognizant of. Good point. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Dan, please. I, really briefly, I just I had a chance to sit with Deborah Ball uh, last week or two weeks ago, who's uh, chairing the Governor's Council on uh, Educator Effectiveness, and I was just uh, really pleased, just um, struck by how deeply thoughtful she is about this work, and really truly about how important this work is. To to Richard's point, I wasn't going to say anything, but um, uh, we we provide a tailwind or headwind for educators, but truly the hard work of getting into port is where that is, you know, when that teacher stands up in the room full of kids, right, or works one-on-one -on -one with a student, um, and uh, just have a lot of hope and optimism and a lot of confidence in Deborah and the rest of that committee as they convene uh, to get started on their work. Yeah. And you can see in multiple ways today uh, the confidence and faith we have in Joseph, who's a key member of that committee, who Deborah Ball, um, I don't know if I should even say this, but her hope at one time was to uh, recruit, which I chastised her for, <laughs> bringing the state down at a very critical time. Um, so, I mean, we really have a good team, and those are two good people within it. And I think, I don't know the ones that the Speaker and the Senate uh, put in, but we recommended Joseph really asked for suggestions from Joseph and Sally. We recommended, and the governor appointed the folks that we recommended. <laughs> they, um, go ahead, go for it. <laughs> I forget where it is now. <laughs> okay, I guess that's it. Mike, before you close the meeting, man and please. his dog. Uh -huh. Mike, where's Mike? your camera? Mike? Mike, before we close the meeting, it's the last meeting we have before the holidays. And we used to have a luncheon with the staff or something with the staff. And I just wanted to say on behalf of the board, mm -hmm. I think I'm speaking for all of us, how much we want to thank all of you yeah, yeah. for the terrific work you've been doing. I mean, it really is impressive. Yeah. And it took a lot. So we really recognize it and thank you and wish you all a most happy, happy holiday season. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Kath. Very appreciate it.